Hello everyone, Vincent Thiel from HDTV Test here. I'm a TV reviewer and master calibrator. In this video, I'm going to review the Sony AF9 Master Series OLED, also known as the A9F in the USA. Two screen sizes are available, namely the 55-inch KD55 AF9, which retails at £3,000, and this 65-inch KD65 AF9, which is a bit pricier at £4,000. The TV features the latest 2018 WRGB OLED panel sourced from LG Display, Sony's new top-end X1 Ultimate video processor, Pixel Contrast Booster technology which aims to retain color saturation at higher luminance, HDR support for the open standard HDR10 static metadata, broadcast-friendly HLG and Dolby Vision dynamic metadata formats, Acoustic Surface Audio Plus sound where the entire screen acts as the speaker, as well as an updated Android Smart TV platform with Android Oreo 8.0. The styling is similar to last year's A1 or A1e OLED. The whole panel tilts back by around 5 degrees, supported by a sturdy stand around the back that houses the electronic components, connections, actuators and subwoofers. Let's be honest, this lean-back design won't be to everyone's taste, but Sony must have shifted enough Bravia A1s to make them think that this design will continue to sell. For the record, we don't mind the design at all. It's different. It's minimalistic. From the front, it looks like just a piece of art, with no stands or speakers to distract you from the picture. Once we sat down and watched the TV straight on for around 30 seconds, we didn't even notice that it's tilted backwards at all. There's a tiny Sony logo at the bottom right corner, and a central LED light, which thankfully can be switched off from the user menu if you find it too distracting in a dark room. The connections are all located on the rear kickstand, including four full bandwidth HDMI 2.0b ports with HDCP 2.3 compliance. Most of the sockets face downwards with good cable management design, although there's a USB port and one HDMI input that face sideways for easier access. New on the AF9, there are a pair of speaker terminals so you can use the TV's acoustic surface speakers as the center channel in your surround sound setup, but unlike the A1 and AF8 OLEDs, the AF9 no longer supports subwoofer out through the headphone jack. The supplied remote control is a cheapskate affair for such a high-end television. The less said, the better. And to cheer things up, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this video. Crampton & More is a UK-based electrical retailer who has been kind enough to sponsor many of our YouTube videos, sometimes even loaning us TVs to review when we can't get samples from manufacturers. I find the staff's knowledge of the products they sell to be excellent. They'll give you unbiased, independent advice for your purchase. So, if you call Crampton & More on 0113-244-6607 and ask for David Corner, mention HDTV Test and he'll take care of you with great price and service. Thanks again for your support. That was beautiful, dude. I think I nailed it. I think I nailed it. The Sony 65 AF9 uses a 2018 WRGB OLED panel, as you can see from a macro photo of the subpixel structure here. Just like what we've observed on most 2018 OLED panels, screen uniformity is excellent and generally improved over 2017 panels. On a 5% full field grey slide, there remained some thin vertical streaks typical of consumer OLEDs, but nothing that would bother us in real life content, even in challenging low light scenes. Bright full field grey slides looked exceedingly clean. There's simply no hint of banding, the discrete effect or DSE, or color tinting as the slides get brighter. Next, calibration. This is something I spent a lot of time investigating throughout this review, so I won't waste time or make mistakes when I visit people's homes to calibrate their AF9s. Okay, so the Master Series AF9 and ZF9 are the first Sony televisions to feature an Advanced Color Management System, or CMS, and to support AutoCal with portrait displays Kalman software. Despite its name, AutoCal doesn't mean that the TV will automatically calibrate itself nor is it something that owners can easily do, because 
you still need to use a meter to measure the grayscale and colors from the screen. A reference signal generator to send the necessary test pattern and a calibration software like Kalman to orchestrate it all. What AutoCal actually means is that the software will do the measurements and adjustments automatically rather than requiring you to do them manually. Now that we are clear on that, let me explain the AutoCal process on the Sony AF9 or A9F. First, you have to download and install the Kalman for Bravia app on the TV through the Google Play Store. Fire up the app and select the HDMI input to which your signal generator is connected. I really appreciate that the TV's IP address is clearly displayed on the top right corner. On other TV brands that support AutoCal, such as the LG and Panasonic OLEDs, what I normally have to do is to go into the network settings submenu to find the IP address before I can connect my laptop to the television, which is more inefficient. Once your laptop is connected to the TV, you can then do Direct Display Control or DDC, which means you can make adjustments to the picture settings directly from your laptop, either manually or through AutoCal, without needing to summon the user menu on the screen at all. Also, two further picture modes are unlocked with the AutoCal process on the Sony AF9, Custom for Pro 1 and Custom for Pro 2. And what professional calibrators like me will usually do is to allocate one for daytime viewing, another one for nighttime viewing. At the time I filmed this video in October 2018, the Kalman for Bravia app is available to download from the Google Play Store, but the necessary Kalman software and workflow that supports Sony Bravia AutoCal is still in private beta. I've been fortunate enough to be given an advanced copy, which I used to calibrate this Sony KD65 AF9 review unit. One interesting thing in the workflow is that Sony is recommending calibrating to a white point with X0.3067 and Y0.3180 coordinates, and this applies to both the AF9 OLED and the ZF9 LED LCD TV. In my opinion, as a professional calibrator who has worked on many different display technologies, including a number of Sony BVM X300 reference mastering monitors, this recommendation is incorrect. X 0.3067, Y 0.318 is what's known as the Judd modified white point and was originally designed to provide a perceptual color match between the BVM X300 and traditional CRT broadcast monitors. However, because the Sony X300 is a true RGB OLED, the Sony AF9 is a WRGB OLED, and the Sony's F9 is an LED LCD with PFS phosphor, all of them have different color spectrums, and I can 100% guarantee you, calibrating all three to the same Judd modified white point will produce different looking whites on all three displays. It is for this reason that I will calibrate the AF9 to an alternative white point that's different to the one recommended by Sony. A quick word on the newly implemented color management system or CMS on the Sony Master Series. From my testing, several of the controls cannot be driven too hard. If you go above a certain value, you'll start introducing posterization in what should be smooth color gradients. Here is a scene from the 1080p Blu-ray of Samsara containing gradients of various colors. I've left the CMS untouched in Custom for Pro 1, while for the Custom for Pro 2 picture mode, I've calibrated the CMS using AutoCal where heavy adjustments were made by the software. Hopefully, even with YouTube's compression, you can see that switching to Custom for Pro 2 introduced an ugly stripe of posterization due to severe color displacement. And that's the problem with using AutoCal on a temperamental CMS. Like Elon Musk on Twitter, it just doesn't know when to stop. Nevertheless, with some careful adjustments using DDC, we were able to achieve accurate colors on our review sample, with none of the 140 measured color patches exceeding the humanly perceptible threshold of Delta Error 3 in this challenging color checker SG chart, which means skin tones and other memory colors should look realistic and natural. Next, motion. OLEDs are sample and hold displays, 
So if you wish to reduce motion blur on the Sony AF9 or A9F, you have to engage either frame interpolation or black frame insertion under the motion flow submenu. Once motion flow is set to custom, you can customize the intensity of frame interpolation using the smoothness slider. Although to achieve the maximum OLED motion resolution of 650 lines, some soap opera effect or SOE would be unavoidable. Nevertheless, Sony's interpolation system generally incurs less noticeable SOE and interpolation artifacts than other TV brands, contributing to the Japanese manufacturer's reputation of being the class leader in motion processing. Black frame insertion is activated by the clearness toggle, but for 24Hz and 50Hz content, the flicker is too tiring to put up with over prolonged periods, so we doubt many owners would use it. Overall, I prefer the Sony AF9's motion performance over the LG C8 and the Panasonic FZ802. LG's true motion interpolation is prone to the odd glitch and stutter, whereas the Panasonic OLED still suffers from occasional frame skips in 24Hz HDR movies. Ok, let's talk about video processing, and this is another area where Sony excels. Upscaling quality is the best we've seen from a consumer television, retrieving sharp detail without excessive rigging or fizziness in an almost magical manner across a variety of sub-4K resolutions. In my earlier unboxing and picture settings video, I was surprised to find that Sony has reduced the film mode setting on the AF9 to basically an on-off toggle, and indeed, this has a negative effect. With film mode engaged, Scrolling tickers on news channels would occasionally tear and stutter as the processor struggled to differentiate between video-based and film-based material. This wasn't a problem on previous Sony TVs because there were three film mode intensities, namely low, medium, and high. And as long as you used the correct one, the TV would apply film mode deinterlacing appropriately rather than aggressively. The solution on the AF9 is to disable film mode if you are seeing tearing and stuttering, but the trade-off is that you may see jaggies and line twitter with interlaced film-based content instead. Rendering of gradients is of extremely high quality, especially with the help of smooth gradation technology, although we think that at the darker end, the gradation is actually slightly worse than the A1 and AF8 OLEDs possibly due to a push for higher brightness with less aggressive ABL or automatic brightness limiter. That said, tonal transitions on the Sony AF9 are still on the whole smoother than TVs from LG, Panasonic and Samsung, well, any other non-Sony manufacturer for that matter. Talking about ABL, Sony has relaxed the algorithm on the AF9 to the extent that it can almost go toe-to-toe -to -toe with LG OLEDs, as you can see from these two expanding white circles showing similar luminous dips around the same time. Which brings us to HDR, where brightness is very important for an impactful HDR experience. First things first, peak brightness measured 610 nits on a 10% window after calibration to D65 white point and 140 nits full fill on our KD65 AF9 review sample. Now, some of you will look at these figures and think, damn, that's too low. But as always, numbers don't tell the whole story. This is because for the first time on a Sony television, I'm seeing clear evidence of dynamic tone mapping at work on the AF9, enabling it to look as bright as it needs to be in HDR10 content, largely irrespective of the measured peak brightness. If you don't know what dynamic tone mapping is, let me explain. HDR10 content, let's say from non-Dolby Vision 4K Blu-rays or Netflix shows, contains static metadata such as mastering display luminance, max CLL and max FALL, and most competent HDR TVs will use this metadata to tone map the source video to within the display's luminance and color range for proper presentation. Since there's only one set of metadata for each HDR10 movie or show, the same tone curve is generally used throughout the entire presentation, which can create problems. Dark scenes can look too dark, or bright scenes can have missing highlight detail. The best solution to this problem is, naturally, dynamic metadata formats such as Dolby Vision and HDR10+, where 
metadata is embedded within the video stream on a scene by scene or even frame by frame basis so that compatible TVs can adjust the tone curve depending on the scene. But there are still tons of HDR10 content with static metadata around, so TV manufacturers started thinking, what if we can ignore the static metadata and just generate the correct tone curve on the fly by analyzing the picture? And that, my friend, is the birth of dynamic tone mapping. Now, Sony's picture engineers prefer to use the term display mapping because they think tone mapping should be reserved for source image processing and computer graphics. But if I'm honest, tone mapping has been used so extensively in the context of HDR TVs by now that I will continue to say tone mapping throughout this video because it is a term that everyone understands. LG is the first TV maker to publicly embrace and market dynamic tone mapping on its 2017 OLED TVs. And now the AF9 appears to carry Sony's version of the technology too. I first caught the AF9 doing dynamic tone mapping when I was using a Meridio 6G generator to trigger HDR mode on the TV. Notice how the brighter columns were gradually restored. This behavior was not present on a Sony AF8 loaded with the latest firmware I calibrated just a few days before this video was published. Next, let's check out this HDR white clipping test pattern where the Sony AF9 manages to resolve even beyond 5000 nits whereas on the AF8, the highlight detail was blown out. The dynamic tone mapping is very clever and effective, allowing the Sony 65 AF9 to put out an HDR image that's sufficiently bright yet retains specular highlight detail, such as the white shirt on constipated bat flag in Batman vs Superman, by changing the tone curve on the fly depending on the scene, even when the measured peak brightness was only 610 nits. I don't remember seeing this level of dynamic tone mapping on the Sony A1 or AF8 when I reviewed them, admittedly quite some time ago. The A1 or A1e tended to clip bright specular highlights, while with the AF8, Sony sought to preserve more bright specular highlights, but overcompensated and made HDR too dark. The AF9 delivers the most impressive HDR from a Sony OLED yet, likely thanks to the processing power of X1 Ultimate chipset, and is comfortably a match for the 2018 LG and Panasonic OLEDs in perceptual brightness terms. Compared with LG's dynamic tone mapping, Sony's is more refined with less luminance fluctuations. Notice how the LG overshoots slightly, then dims back down to restore bright details in the clouds, whereas the Sony is more stable. Oh, by the way, Dynamic tone mapping is always on during playback of HDR10 content across all picture modes we tested, including HDR game mode. There's no way to switch it off from the user menu, unlike on the LG OLEDs. But we don't really see any reason to turn off dynamic tone mapping on the Sony AF9, since it works so effectively and seamlessly to boost HDR presentation. Even in dark scenes where bright subtitles are appearing and disappearing, for example, this one from The Revenant, the AF9's dynamic tone mapping does not draw attention to itself. Of course, dynamic tone mapping is not applied in Dolby Vision picture mode, since the format already has its own dynamic metadata for tone curve adjustment on a scene-by-scene -scene or even frame-by-frame -frame basis. The Dolby Vision profile implemented on the Sony Bravia AF9 television is the same as that implemented on X1 Extreme televisions such as the ZD9, XC93, XC94, XF90, A1, and AF8, which means that the source device needs to carry the same player-led profile before Dolby Vision playback can take place. At the time I filmed this video in October 2018, if you have a Sony X700, an Oppo 203 or 205, a Panasonic UB820 or UB9000, or an Apple TV 4K box, then you're good to go, although I may have missed out some other devices. When I reviewed the Sony A1 and the Sony AF8, they haven't been updated with the Dolby Vision firmware yet, so this is the first time I've properly tested Dolby Vision content on a Sony OLED, and I have to say I'm somewhat disappointed. I don't know whether it's the player-led profile or what, 
but the most accurate Dolby Vision dark picture mode looks too dim with some crushing of shadow detail, be it from the internal Netflix app or over HDMI from a Dolby Vision Blu-ray, especially when you compare side-by-side -side against a calibrated LG OLED, which of course features the full-fat hardware-based Dolby Vision profile. Thank god I didn't eBay off my two copies of Power Rangers. I didn't think anyone would buy it anyway. You can use Dolby Vision Bright or adjust the Gamma or Advanced Contrast Enhancer settings to brighten the picture, but then it would also blow out some specular highlight detail, which defeats the entire purpose of Dolby Vision, where such specular highlights are meant to be preserved through dynamic metadata. I hope Sony and Dolby can work together to improve the Dolby Vision picture on Sony OLEDs, but I know there will be lots of back and forth, beta firmwares, debugging, submission for approval, etc. So it will all take time, maybe a long time. In the meantime, I genuinely believe you can get a better HDR experience on the Sony AF9 by sending HDR10 video signal to the TV and allowing dynamic tone mapping to do its thing. The result is excellent, and I totally understand why Sony doesn't see any need to join the HDR10 Plus camp. We're almost near the end of this video now, so if you have stuck around for so long, thank you for your patience. You might as well continue watching for a few minutes more. I want to talk a bit about the Netflix calibrated mode on the Sony Bravia KD65 AF9. From my testing, when you engage Netflix calibrated mode on Dolby Vision content, it's equivalent to the default factory settings in Dolby Vision Dark mode. The picture doesn't change one bit. However, once you disable Netflix calibrated mode, the picture mode jumps back to the less accurate Dolby Vision Bright picture preset. With SDR Netflix content, the Netflix calibrated mode is equivalent to the factory custom picture preset with brightness decreased to 12, which corresponds to around 110 nits peak white. And once you switch off Netflix calibrated mode in SDR, the picture reverts to the highly inaccurate standard mode making it seem as if Netflix calibrated mode is indeed more accurate. In my opinion, there's no need to use Netflix calibrated mode over the usual accurate picture presets. Sony has lowered input lag on the AF9 to 27 milliseconds in both 1080p SDR and 4K HDR game modes. While this figure is still behind the 21 milliseconds delivered by LG's and Panasonic's OLEDs, Closing the gap down to 5 milliseconds means that hardcore gamers will no longer be put off buying Sony OLEDs to play reflex-based games in a responsive manner. Also, I would like to congratulate Sony for adopting the most accurate color temperature with minimal edge enhancement by default in game mode on the AF9, something that cannot be said of most other TV brands or even Sony's previous TVs for that matter. I need to cover three more things before wrapping up this video. 1. Dimming Sony has recently issued a firmware update to improve the anti-static dimming behavior on the A1 and AF8 to be less aggressive, and the same algorithm is used on the AF9. What this means is yes, the screen will dim gradually over time to prevent OLED screen burn if static elements are detected on screen, but it's now so subtle and shouldn't interfere with your viewing, even with peak luminance set to high. Here's a time-lapse video of a football match with a static logo and peak luminance set to high on the AAF9, showing no significant drop in brightness over 40 minutes. Sorry I've had to blur the video, or else YouTube's football copyright team will come down on me with the wrath of a millennial missing his morning latte. 2. Android TV It's lightning fast now, thanks to an upgraded MediaTek MT5893 chipset with 4GB RAM. If you have been put off by the sluggishness of Android on Sony TVs before, this will totally change your opinion. It's like going from 5 megabits per second broadband to 70 megabits per second fiber. Speed is just so addictive once you've experienced it. Note that like on Sony X1 Extreme TVs, the internal YouTube app can run 4K but not HDR. One workaround is to cast the HDR YouTube video from your phone to the AF9, but still the AF9 will be using the wrong transfer function, resulting in a washed out picture, so you will need to manually enable HDR10 mode to apply the correct EOTF, and then 
Remember to disable HDR10 mode when watching SDR YouTube video. It's a pain, even for someone like myself who enjoys pushing buttons. So hopefully Sony can work on a proper fix. Last but not least, the center channel mode. It works well, but because different speakers have different timbre and coloration, you may need to tweak the TV or receiver equalizer to match other speakers in your surround sound setup. I wouldn't base any purchase decision solely on the center channel mode. Just treat it as a bonus if you manage to get it to work in your setup. It's refreshing to be able to hear sound coming directly from the action on screen rather than from below the television. Right, let's sum up. The Sony AF9 is a worthwhile upgrade over the A1 and the AF8, offering four full bandwidth HDMI 2.0b ports, lower input lag, faster Android TV interface, and most importantly in terms of picture quality, more impactful HDR10 presentation thanks to a combination of less aggressive ABL and dynamic tone mapping. If you have been following this YouTube channel for some time, you'll know that no TV is perfect, and every television has its own strengths and weaknesses. The color fidelity of the Sony AF9 isn't as accurate as the Panasonic FZ802 or FZ952, and its Dolby Vision performance isn't as impressive as LG's 2018 OLEDs. But in its favor, the Sony AF9 has got the best upscaling, it's got the best motion, and it's got the smoothest gradation. How much value you place on these attributes will determine whether you are willing to pay a premium over LG and Panasonic OLEDs. Now that its HDR10 presentation is on par with, and input lag is within touching distance of the LG and Panasonic OLED TVs, the Sony AF9 fully deserves our highly recommended Best in Class award. If you found this video useful, please click the like button and subscribe to the HDTV Test YouTube channel for more videos like this. Thank you for watching for almost a full 30 minutes, and I'll see you in the next video.